you believe you're seeing your religion fall apart, but you're going to church with a bunch of people who they're still throwing their hands in the air and they're still crying out to God. And, and you're like, yo, do you see this? Yeah. It's wild that you have to do this much work to disprove an obviously man-made fabrication. That's what Paul said, right? The God who did X, Y, and Z is the one who did this. Well, you take X, Y, and Z away, what am I left with? Well, well, one through three, yeah. One through three. Yeah. The non-historicity. Actually, yeah, 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 he's right. Yeah, Absolutely. Non-historicity and the... Welcome back to another episode of Icapod. I am your host, Be Good, joined by Albert Kim and Jay Witness Protection in hiding as always. Um, I gathered the crew together tonight because this is sort of a follow-up to an episode we did a while ago. Uh, we came on talking about the six stages of deconversion. And we talked about uh, how people go from a lot of people start off as fundamentalist believers, and then they learn some things and they realize, oh, I kind of, I can't hold that as tight. I got to let that go a little bit. And they go through these stages. And before you know it, they become more liberal, uh, theologically, maybe socially. And we get to this, this point where all of a sudden you, you become skeptical. And um, this is sort of a compendium to that, where um, I put up something on Facebook, I'll share this so you guys can just see it, and uh, maybe it'll excite you or incite you like it did the people on Facebook. Deconversion is hard. Deconstruction is easy. Just turn the same critical lens you have for other religions against your own. And people, you know, begin to chime in like, yeah, that's right. That's what I did. Da, da, da. Then a few people got at me and said, no, Brady, like deconstruction is not easy. Very difficult, very, uh, you know, perplexing and all these things people have to go through. And so the next day I posted something that was sort of an amended version. <laughs> I said, <laughs> um, deconstruction is easy if you deconvert first. If you deconvert right. first, you're no longer interested in trying to save parts of your, your, your faith or whatever, your belief system. And then people trying to say, ah, now you're on point because... If you deconstruct first, it's difficult. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is there are people who they do deconvert first and then find themselves spending the next several years deconstructing. We've even had people in our comments say, I deconverted years ago, but I'm still deconstructing. I'm still coaching myself to unbelieve things that I believed years ago. Um so this, I want this to be helpful for the people who are deconstructing first. I want those people to, to see, okay, this is the road that I'm probably on. And those who already deconverted, but you still haven't deconstructed, this will also be helpful to you. So we talked about the uh, six stages of deconstruction. Today, <laughs> we're going to talk about the five dimensions of the deconstruction multiverse. <laughs> all right. So uh, uh, just think about uh, all that might mean. Um, like yeah. it's, it's, it's not just one thing, you know what I mean? It's not just, Oh, well this led me down this road or this led me to this path. Um, it's sort of a multiplicity of things. And what we're not going to do is we're not going to try to say, even though we're going to, you know, give you one, two, three, four, five, the people who will start off at number three, there are people who will start off at number five. So our one, two, three, four, five is not a uh, consecutive order as much as it is. Um, these are just five things, five dimensions of what people typically go through as they deconstruct that leads many people to deconversion or they deconvert first. And then they think back about, wait, why was this decision so beneficial? Oh yeah, because, and then they deconstruct and they go through these things. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, do you guys have any things, um, even if you think about your own process, how much was it important to you to deconstruct even after you deconverted? Or do you feel like you did all your deconstruction beforehand so that once you deconverted, there was really not much for you to do? 
Uh, I, I can go first. I think for me, it was, I think I was selective about my deconstruction after mm -hmm. my deconversion. Um, mm -hmm. Not every aspect of uh, trying to make sense of all of the data mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, like important to me at the time. So I, I think for me, the obviously the biggest thing was seeing Christianity through kind of the mythological lens and um, trying to kind of round out some of those, like, you know, a little bit more for me kind of personally. But mm. I think the, the, when it came to much more other ways of deconstructing, you know, historical, scientific, and mm. um, I, I think all that stuff came kind of later. And I think for a while, I didn't want to do that for a little while. Like I was, I was so glad to be out of the faith mm. that I was like, I was like, I could, that, you know, I don't need to think about that right now. Okay. And I, I think, I think that's fine to do too. Right. That's, that's one yeah. way to do it. You know, you don't yeah. gotta tackle it all at once. You know? Right. So. And, yeah. and do you think there's any danger? Cause you say you don't want to do it right now. And it took you a while. I remember even on this podcast, you said this has been helpful for you because you were kind of going back and rethinking things that you thought over yeah. 10 years ago when you were a believer. Um, yeah. What do you think? Are there any risks to never deconstructing? It's a great question. Uh, I don't know, man. Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe I need to think about that. But I, okay. I, I, I think one risk that I can say is may, maybe it, it's important for anybody, mm. like even if it's not about religion, if it's about anything mm -hmm. that's important out there, I mean, always questioning mm -hmm. is, I think, you know, it, it's a way to examine not only your life, but, you know, how you, you know, you know, the, like, you know, just asking, like, the, the, does this really make sense? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, does it really make sense? Like, I, you know, I just want, I need to ask that question again. Right. Yeah. So I think, I think that process is always mm -hmm. important no matter what. So, that, you know. Yeah. Somebody yeah. commented under one of our recent videos, they said, thank you for this podcast. It's keeping me sane. Right. You know what I mean? And I right. think part of the keeping people sane is, we're saying, like you just said, Al, that the world doesn't really work the way we thought it worked with a sovereign God doing this, that, and the third. And unless you do this, that, and the third, you're not going to be pleasing in his sight and all that. And so if we're saying this is not how the world really works, but you come from a religious community where, yeah, that's how the world works is what people are telling you. I can see how it would be very difficult to maintain your sanity if you're like, oh, I don't think it works that way, but your community is telling you it does. And so something like this could be very beneficial. And if you never, I don't know, uh, um, Jay Witt, maybe you can begin to answer that question even as you answer the other one. Do you think it's possible to deconvert without ever deconstructing? And then even for yourself, after you deconverted, was all your deconstruction done or did you need to continually deconstruct? Hmm. Well, my more immediate answer to that would be that all things that are possible are possible. Mm. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, that's my take on the scriptures, all things with God, all things are possible. <laughs> so I, I mean, but it's also, it's also speaking to the truth that there are probably as many ways to deconvert or deconstruct as there are people. Yeah. So, um, my so there's a sense in which my thoughts on the matter aren't particularly important or relevant although that's not what you're asking me about you're not asking me are they relevant or important you're asking yeah. what do i think yeah and i'm just saying i my thoughts will be that there probably literally are as many ways to approach this as there are people mm -hmm. i for and, and it's to so i guess i address the latter half of the question first so the former part of the question being how did i which came first, the deconversion or the deconstruction? Well, hold on. Even to, to what you just said, I would even probably challenge that and add this. Tell me what you think. I think if a person has deconverted, they have to have in some way deconstructed to some degree. You can yeah. deconstruct without deconverting, but I don't think you can deconvert without deconstructing. Uh... Agree, agree or disagree? I, 
I'm hesitant. To, you know, one thing I've become is far less dogmatic since I left <laughs> dogma. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. I mean, but yeah. I mean, sure, sure it's fair. Well, I, in the I chat, guess what you're saying is fair. In the chat, you guys can discuss. Do you think that's true? You can deconstruct without deconverting, but you can't deconvert without deconstructing. Talk about that. But go ahead, Jay Witt. Yeah. So addressing the former question, that being which came first for me. I was thinking while you, when you asked it and while Albert was sharing his experience, I can't even tell you, I think the deconversion was the byproduct of my deconstruction, but I never recognized when it happened. Yeah. So uh, it, it was a necessary result of my, so in, since it, in a sense, it does follow what you just stated, Brady. For me, that is, mm -hmm. that is to say, I can't identify exactly when the deconversion happened. I just mm -hmm. know eventually I realized I was no longer a believer. Yeah. Um, so I had, I, I hope to be part of the way we speak of it. Uh, um, I had begun the deconversive process. Yeah. <laughs> as like, as to speak of it as an adjective. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I, I believe that it, I had undergone this process of deconversion or uh, deconstruction that resulted in a deconversion that I didn't realize had happened until probably sometime after it had happened. Mm. Now, I don't know exactly, um, just to be generous enough to give myself accuracy, some degree of accuracy, I would say it happened sometime within a year. Like a, a lot of this happened in this in that year, but I don't know. You know, I, I was once. All I knew was that once I was blind, and now I see. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to remind folks, I'm going to flash uh, something else for us to take a look at here. Uh, this is what we said. We talked about this weeks or many moons ago. All right. So these were the six stages of deconversion all right you went from being fundamentalist to uh questioning your ideas about inerrancy and infallibility could the bible be uh, possibly uh communicating things that are not a hundred percent truth even though it's still giving us truths um become socially liberal theologically liberal at some point you find yourself praying less until you're prayerless reading the bible less until you're bible less going to church less until you're church less and then your your skeptical powers, as Jay Witt said in an early episode, your skeptical powers are are fully awakened and run amok. <laughs> um, they take over into the point where you 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 sort of question uh, what you believe, and you realize you don't believe uh, uh, things that that are uh, incredible at this point. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the five dimensions of deconstruction, and then we're going to try to tie if we can. If we can, maybe as we go through each stage, we're going to try to tie them back into um, some of those stages of deconversion. So we're going to try to tie deconstruction to deconversion while recognizing, as Jay Witt said, there is no one way, right? I might tie step four of deconstruction to stage two of deconversion. For somebody else, it may have happened completely different. So we're just going to think through this mainly to allow those who are listening and thinking through this, who are going through some of this to say, that's where I'm at. That's my process. Or, or that's sort of what I'm going through. Mine is a, is a little different because all of this is helpful. What we're providing for people is we're providing third party objective feedback for one another, because I might think I see things a certain way. Yo, did you see that? You could be out with somebody and you you're both in front of a car accident. But you turn to the person, yo, did you see that? Like, I'm right here beside you. Of course I saw it. But the did you see that is there's something about our Constitution where that that external confirmation so that we know I'm not bugging. And that's what this podcast sort of does for people is you believe you're seeing your religion fall apart. But you're going to church with a bunch of people who they're still throwing their hands in the air and they're still crying out to God and they're... And you're like, yo, do you see this? But they don't see mm -hmm. it. So then you I think come... it's... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's important. 
this is so important that people who are watching, who are regular listeners and watchers of the podcast to understand, because there are some people who seem to think that the podcast would be improved if it were just turned into something that it has never been intended to be, which like is debate. some sort of, yeah, debate. Let's have the back and forth with the Christian apologists. This has never been the intent for this mm -hmm. to be that. This is uh, this is what they like to call a safe space for people. Yeah. I, I spoke to Brady some time ago about the idea of a hot mic, mm. you know, the idea, you know, the kinds of things that a person who may be in the faith and they can't express what we were feeling when we were leaving, we're given voice. <laughs> we're a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. <laughs> we're crying out for those who can't, yeah. who, who can't, we're making straight paths for them. <laughs> thought that they closed the way in the closet, and we're saying, "Hey, it's okay. We're we're still alive. It's a decade or more outside of the faith, and look, we're here. Yeah, we're going through sickness. We're 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 able to manage life without mm. this book of of myths. Mm. And um, it's it's okay for you to think what you're thinking. In fact, it's good and proper for you to think what you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, but this is not a place for every, this, this is not a democracy. We're not trying to give <laughs> voice to right. every religious dissenting voice that there yeah. could possibly be. You know, we're, we're not here to tease out the best, to, to tease these things out in conversation or to converse with the best Christian apologists on any given topic. That's not the purpose, right? Yeah. I, I Can I get an amen, brothers? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We're headed to the promised land. <laughs> All right. So we're going to dive in and begin to look at uh, the five dimensions of the deconstruction multiverse. And I have the privilege of giving the first dimension. And so uh, the first dimension is what we will call the irreconcilable differences or the non-univocal nature of the Bible. And what that basically means is at some point, the believer begins to recognize that what they're holding in their hand is, it's not just multifaceted, it's multi-voices. You're hearing different themes, you're hearing different ideas, but you're also hearing different ideas about the same thing. And at some point you realize, wait, this can't, this can't all be true. You were taught that the Bible had a univocal presentation, even though it had many writers. I remember I was young and there's this, this, this saying that you memorize as a young Christian, right? Bible was written in what over um, uh, so many different countries over so many different spans of years by over 40 different people. And then the amazing thing about that is supposed to be, but it's got one voice. It's telling one story. Um, we call it in certain pockets of Christianity, we call it um, the the redemptive history. You got creation, fall, redemption. The Bible's telling this one streamlined story, and so you you get into this idea where you you you're harmonizing things that seem to be contradictions because no, it's one voice, right? Even though it's many human authors, it's one divine author saying one thing. And at some point, it dawns on you like, yo, these human authors really do seem to be saying some very different things. And maybe your first uh, recognition of that is you just look around and you realize like, yo, what does Paul say? Um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, but then you look around and you say, man, we got a lot of different denominations out here. We got a lot of different churches and a lot of, how do you, how do you get all these denominations? Is it just pride of the leaders? Like this one doesn't want to bow to this one. This one doesn't want, they don't want to compromise. Is it, you see all these things. But then you look in the text, you say, ah, but, you know, I could see why this church believes this and that church believes that. And they really can't worship together on Sunday morning because these guys want to speak in tongues. And, you know, these guys over here say, you know, do, do all speak in tongues? Paul asked the question. Um, but someone else says, uh, but, but have you received the, the Holy Spirit since you believed? And, and then they think, well, one of the signs of that is, then you end up looking around saying, well, man, we got a lot of different things we can disagree about from this same Bible. I just wrote down a few different things. Um, can salvation be lost? Yes or no? 
Churches may split over that. Um, does baptism have anything to do with salvation? Yes or no? Churches may split over that. Is hell uh, is hell annihilation, or is it is it eternal conscious torment, or is it more like what you see in the Old Testament? This picture of Sheol. Churches can split over that. Um, is there going to be a rapture? Is the kingdom now or later? Is Jesus preparing a place for us to be with Him, like He said, or is He coming back to shut up shop here? You have all these different ideas that you see these denominations split off into. And as a Christian, you're just thinking, okay, I just got to study to show myself approved more. And what happens is you find yourself trying to get a more sure word. And so you find yourself going back to, well, wait, when did all these denominations jump off? Ah, Martin Luther and them in the Reformation. Let me go back to before then. He said, well, that was the, the Catholic Church. Well, no, that maybe maybe don't we don't want to go back to being Catholic. Let's go back even further than that. So you become, you go back to the patristic era, the church fathers, and you're reading, well, what did... Uh, you know, Tertullian and all these all these early Christians think. And you realize that wait, they weren't all they weren't all united either. And so you find yourself going back even further. Well, let me what about and then some Christians I've talked to very many, they end up adopting a form of Christianity that's very close to Judaism because they feel like they're trying to go back far enough to not have all these different voices. And then they realize, well man, even even in Judaism, even the rabbinical traditions, they had all these different ideas about what the text meant. And you realize, well, man, even the Jews didn't have this idea of a univocal text. They saw the tension, whether it be between Genesis 1 and 2 or Genesis 10 and 11, as we talked about, so many different places in the text where this doesn't agree with this. And they just lived with the tension. They didn't try to harmonize it like we do as Christians. And then you mm -hmm. find yourself saying like, well, what do I do then? Like, can I ever arrive at something that I could call, this is a sure word from God that's not splintered into many voices. And you end up doing one or two things. You either end up saying, I can't blow the whistle and throw out the red flag on any of it because maybe it's all God. Maybe, maybe God's just going to use it, all these interpretations to sort of just mold us into what he wants us to be and believe. And some people end up getting so broad in their interpretation, they're like, well, man, if I'm going to allow God to speak to speak through many different interpretations of the Bible, can I really say he can't speak through many different holy books? Like maybe even, maybe I can't even rule out some other, maybe that's just God, how, how God spoke to them. You end up so broad that you realize either I've got to be able to okay it all, or I really can't, I really can't be sure about any of it. And if I can't be sure about any of it, why am I really calling this God's word? This ends up looking more like the words of many men instead of the words of God. And so for very many people in their deconstruction, this is where they end up. They end up with believing that they have the words of men and wondering how is God speaking through any of this? Uh, I want to play a clip from... from uh, a guy we call Captain Dan at this point because he's just been so on point with his critiques. But before I play this clip, any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I got one. I I feel like what you've described, Brady, is a certain kind of intellectual honesty uh, mm. that someone has to, I think, adopt or at least be at least consciously, you know, like you may not have a methodology or framework in terms of how to do that, but you at least know that you want to be authentic and how you, mm, yeah. you know, go about this process. But I, I think one of the things that can hold people back from getting there, um, I remember being at Grace Community Church with some of the seminarians. And this is a master's call it seminary thing. I don't know, the, you know, what the, how Westminster uh, students or professors would respond to this, but uh, they were very adamant about the text having one interpretation. Mm. That one interpretation, like it doesn't matter, like anywhere from Genesis to Revelation, mm. uh, that is that is the you know like the goal in terms of what you do as an exegete. So, mm. um, I feel like 
things, ide ideology, I'm going to call it an ideology, I feel, because I feel like those kinds of things can get in the way, I think, of people coming to uh, more of a disposition that at least you had, uh, had developed and other people have, you know, people who are listening here. Um, and I feel like there can be other ways that people can, you know, that have these weird interpretive hermeneutics, like, you know, just, just like a weird her hermeneutic can keep mm -hmm. you from, I think, getting to that place. Do, my, any thoughts on that? I don't know what, what you might think on that, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I um, think you're, yeah, you're, you're right on with that. Like there's, yeah. there are different ways that people try to deal with it. Um, and then there are different ways that the church tries to manage it. And one right. of the ways that people try to manage it is like you said, uh, just continuing to promote that that one voice and it's your job as a believer to study to show yourself approved to find that one voice right. um the, the eastern orthodox church right they say well that one voice is not really even found in the text the way that they get that one voice is they go to uh the church itself the church and this sort of kind of gets back even into the, what the roman papacy uh idea is the church becomes the authority not the bible and the church tells you what that one voice is. Um, because if you're left with the text, you will end up with, with the multiplicity of things. But then you go to the church and they say, well, no, this is how we streamline it. I think that Christians tend to think of it the way the U.S. thinks of the U.S. Right? E pluribus unum, mm. like out of many, out of one. The many one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember there was a guy, his name was... Uh, his, guy, his name was Richard Lovelace. I had read a book mm. called The Dynamics of the Spiritual Life. But he mm. wrote this very, it was almost, well, no, not almost. It was ecumenical in the sense that it was very broad in its range mm. uh, in, in considering different Christian movements. And I think it's just important to recognize that I, 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 this might lead to as many questions as it does to answers. But Christians have, because of the some of the problems you've unfolded and just this opening concern about the non-univocal nature of the text and what it leads to is because, you know, if you don't have one voice, then you're going to have many different people, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and many Christians have tried to resolve, the, you know, the, um, to kind of maintain a certain kind of tension of, we're all one, this e pluribus unum uh, or uh, kind of idea. Um, we're all one in essentials, essentially. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not to be repetitive, essentials, essentially. But there, there's a, there's a, a certain uh, category of beliefs that are essential to be in this body, whatever it is, and we're all one in that. Uh, and then after that, there's yeah. this whole, this very large category. So I guess, I guess they would say that that category is, is quite small, but very important. Yeah. And then the latter category is quite large, but not as important. Right. Yeah, there's the old quote that was attributed, I think, to Augustine, right? In the essentials, you must have unity. In the non-essentials, we can express liberty, but in all things, charity. Mm -hmm. um, the only the problem with this is you, I think you were about to say exactly we're we're on one accord again, brother. <laughs> right. Go, ahead, go on the, ahead. The, the problem it. is who gets to determine what are the essentials and what do you do when mm -hmm. somebody puts something in their essential category that you have in your non-essential category? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let me play this clip from from Dan here. Let me share, and uh, we'll see what he has to say. There is no such thing as a biblical literalist. Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. I'm a scholar of the Bible and religion, and I count at least three reasons you cannot have biblical literalism. The first is that the text of the Bible as a text has no inherent meaning. Meaning is generated through a process of negotiation. Readers engage the text in specific circumstances, and those readers and their specific circumstances are almost always going to take priority in that negotiation. The text is going to be leveraged as the authority for whatever reading is negotiated, but the text is pretty much never going to dictate precisely what comes out of the end of that negotiation, and particularly if doing so would compromise the interests or the power structures 
of the readers in their circumstances. Second reason is that the text is not univocal. Yeah, it is can. inconsistent. It frequently contradicts itself. And so in that process of negotiation, the text is going to be smoothed out so that it is something that is livable by actual people operating in time and space. And that means that certain things in the text are going to be centered and prioritized and other things in the text are going to be marginalized, suppressed, reinterpreted, or outright ignored. And whether people want to acknowledge that mm -hmm. or not, everyone who approaches the Bible as an authoritative text has rejected, marginalized, suppressed, ignored parts of the text that are uncomfortable to them and their traditions and their needs and exigencies. Yeah, so he basically just said in, in short form what I just took a minute to say there, uh, once people begin to realize this, that speeds them down the road of at least deconstruction, and if not stopping there, deconversion. And I'm going to pass the mic on to Al for dimension number two. What you got? All right. So the subject that I'm going to deal with, uh, number two, is uh, what we're calling the non-historical nature of biblical history, and which touches on... Uh, uh, an historical analysis of of you know the whole idea of redemptive history. Uh, for the sake of kind of brevity and and our purposes, I'm gonna kind of well, I'm gonna talk about what I mean by historical, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna mention uh, at least two, maybe three examples of what I mean, and and we'll, we'll just kind of take us through there. So, uh, so the criteria that I'm kind of referring to, and I know it's a long conversation, but Let's just stick to this idea, number one, of uh, independent attestation, which mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a historical point needs to have, you know, whether it's an event, person or place or, uh, you know, needs to be confirmed by, you know, independent sources. Um, number two, physical evidence. So that's going to involve archaeological findings, mm -hmm. usually. And number three, contextual plausibility. So, and that's going to talk about the internal coherence of, uh, you know, a certain historical claim, you know. Mm. And uh, so, let's let first one on the list, right? Uh, we're going to talk. Let's talk about the Exodus. So, wh why the Exodus? You know, I could have talked about the Syrian siege of Jerusalem or the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. There's a whole list, but let's kind of start with there because I think we all agree that. Uh, the Exodus is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, you know, Paul in the book of Romans does a very long exposition of, you know, how the new covenant in Christ, you know, relates to uh, the Exodus and he uses all of the same mm. typological ways to describe it in terms mm. of how we define the gospel and, you know, the whole idea of redemption. Um, but let's talk about um so let's see here so we can talk about the fact that number one there's there's a lack of contemporary egyptian records for the exodus right um we have uh so you just think about it like there's there was hundreds of thousands of uh, uh hebrews living uh, in slavery um which is you know an enormous kind of figure uh, just, just like think about the ancient world, like we we live in a world that has seven billion people, but you know, for civilization back then to have hundreds of thousands of slaves is enormous. Um, now, none of the Egyptians r record anything about mm. the slavery, mm. uh, the exodus, the um, the plays, all of the plays, just like think about the scale of mm -hmm. the, you know, all of the things that came upon the Egyptians and as well as, you know, just, just the entire narrative that there was this, you know, mass exodus and so on and so forth. So, uh, that's number one. Um, yeah. Now, uh, could, yeah, could you, would, would you say, as I think you would say that they don't even need the Pharaoh is never named who, who is, he's just called Pharaoh, but, uh, um, he's just called Pharaoh. Yeah. There, there's great debate about who this Pharaoh was, was even in the text. Like who, who is he? I mean, there's speculation about, oh, he could be this particular character from history, but no particular Pharaoh that we know of fits, hmm. uh, fits into this, yeah. this, uh, the story. Cleanly. I, I, 
I'm sure some of the, someone in the audience probably knows why Remesis tends to be assumed, you know, in, in some of the pop literature, uh, you know, or but there are there are problems there making him. Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard of. I don't know what they are, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm sure there's a deep dive study into that one. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's yeah, thanks, Jay. Witt. That's a good one. Um, so archaeological evidence is obviously a huge one because mm -hmm. if we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people, there should be evidence of mm -hmm. pottery, uh, you know, just the Hebrew way of life, right, mm -hmm. in Egypt that, you know, no evidence there. Or the there. wilderness. Or the wilderness, yeah. The, the wilderness is the big one because, you know, they were out there, like, you know, the Exodus story is pretty detailed about, like... Mm -hmm you know, what the activities were for the 40 years. <laughs> and there is no evidence of any of that. There's no, uh, you know, and, and we're, and we're talking about like, you know, areas where they're, you know, current day and the, the Sinai Peninsula, I think that's what it's called. They, you know, like there, there's like long stretches of land and then there's like mountains and caves and caverns and it, the, you know, hmm. you would think that you would find something. Mm. right and and it's it's very sparse today um like there I and mean, the the best evidence that i heard was there was like paintings on, in in a cave that described the exodus maybe but that's mm. that's literally the best like there's no evidence that there was actually settlement mm -hmm. and people living in, in in that parts of the world so right. um so that's that's another big one um now we're going to let's and then the contextual plausibility so that's another one right like we're, if we're talking about the dates in which these events were to take place i mean the you know um but even even the way that genesis describes some of the cities mm -hmm. and places at the time don't cooperate at all with historical evidence um that if anybody's once you know once that information i can totally give that to you isn't there like comments, a huge but... debate and I, i'm asking but i know this there's like a huge debate between bible between old testament scholars between scholars of the ancient near east christian right. and non-christian about when this could have even taken place because based on the cities that they name and based on things that they talk about in the text you could either be looking at the uh 14th century you could be looking at the 12th century or you could be looking at a time even earlier but it, it it none of it really pans out, so right. they don't even really know when this would have taken place. Right. Yeah, but of course yeah. we don't need to have everything. Uh, <laughs> what Wakanda doesn't need. We don't need to know where where Wakanda <laughs> happened. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. I couldn't and help it. it. It's a little perverse. <laughs> so th this is also like I you know we can get into debates about like you know where the parting of the Red Sea took place like mm. was it even the Red Sea you know that you can you can watch the Sea of Reeds of, <laughs> the Sea of Reeds right, right correct and then and then they try to rationalize the fact that it's you know probably you know the, the way that the wind patterns you know mm. like, I'm not I'm not going to even go there yeah. right because once again it's all speculative and mm. uh, but my 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 thing you know about the Exodus is that if if we're going to base not only you know the foundations of how the the law was given mm. you know of how uh the the prototype of the you know the the government that was going to be put in place and mm -hmm. all of the ceremonial laws and etc i mean we're we're talking about the 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 foundational aspects of to Judaism and therefore the foundations for how the gospel is going to be framed in, in mm. the new testament under christ i mean this i mean that there's no question right <laughs> we're you know that that this is hugely problematic from a mm. fundamental level so mm. um that's uh that's my reason for number one any any last words before i move on to the next yeah i just thought of something actually yeah. we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago and now it's coming up here uh <laughs> remember when they when they go, because part of the exodus is after the exodus, they spend it for years, then they finally do get to go into the, the promised land, but they've right. got to take it. They've got to conquer this land. And when they go to conquer this land, they go into uh, to the to the first city and they encounter the, the, the harlot Rahab. And uh, she says, oh, we heard about what your God did in Egypt. So if they heard about what their God did, this is 40 years later now. Right. 
<laughs> if you heard about what their God did in Egypt 40 years ago, that means word has spread. So it's not just we should be able to find in Egypt some kind of third party attestation to what you guys are saying right. happened. All these other peoples that you're saying, when we encountered them, they knew what our God did and they knew what our God did. Why don't they have any records of what your God did? Yeah. And so it, it, they, they only they only have they only have any recollection within your own recollection. <laughs> right. <laughs> their recollection is your recollection of their recollection. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so it and just you, makes you, the story seem that much more. This you you guys are making this up, right? Yeah. And you would think that that their adversaries, if if they actually believe those stories, that they were even, you know, mm. uh you know, you would think that would they even have put up a fight? Wouldn't, wouldn't you just surrender if that's you know right. what God, you know, your your Yahweh can do to us? So, mm. yeah, raises a lot of other questions. But yeah, yeah. that's not the um, there's there's so many problems with this. Like, it's not to mention <laughs> that if 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 you're literally fighting God, what are we even doing here? Like, he could just he could just <laughs> literally kill everybody. He doesn't have right. to he doesn't have to make it this massacre, this war. You know, exactly. like he can make well, it a far he, he cleaner wants, victory. He wants the people to participate in the victory so that they could own it. Yeah. Whatever, okay. Whatever All right. well, I guess, I, I, guess I, I guess you've now taken on the, the role of the biblical apologist. <laughs> well, well, the decon the deconstructing person is going to try to figure out, well, why why would a God need a people if he's giving them the land? Why would he need them to participate in yeah. the fight? And and why wouldn't there be any records? Why wouldn't I could see the person who's deconstructing before deconverting learning that they like the exodus is shaky. And not only shaky, but extremely questionable. And saying, but I but I've got to find some kind of way to hold on to this. And so you're going to be grasping for straws to find yeah. something to hold on to here. I I, I gotta let Albert move on, but I, I have to say this. And this is this is weird. This is this, but I have to say it. You know, when we look at technology and advancement in technology, we usually judge it by its efficiency its ability to do a thing better than it did it previously. Now, mm -hmm. of course, I, I know the answer from the Christian. The Christians are say, well, God's wisdom, he knows something down the line <laughs> that is going to make the circuitous, you know, that's going to make it all make sense, you know, like it's going to make a flood instead of just killing off all the evil people and not all the plants that are amoral and everything else that died to dolphins or whatever else and the mixing of salt and fresh water. You know, we're not going to worry about that. Um, that is all cleared up if you have God's omniscience, because clearly the guy who's omniscient, but who doesn't know that about hymens and all kinds of other stuff, apparently about Aborigines and Australia, uh, clearly, he, although he lacks all of these other knowledge, the knowledge of Native Americans, et cetera, he knows a way to make all of this waste make sense. That's all. I, that's all I gotta say is like you can look at the lack of the knowledge in the Bible, like you know the lack of commentary on things that we know to be true. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think it was Brady who said in the last podcast that he posted, he talked about the nature of the dispersion of 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 uh, um, uh, the people. And nations. From, from, uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm how the, the conspicuous absence of certain people groups that we know existed at the time. Mm. But it seems that there is a there is a, a Venn diagramish overlap that is so great between <laughs> the human lack of knowledge and God's lack of knowledge that you just have to assume that they are one and the same. <laughs> so, right. so it's like, yeah, so we look at it, we know that there is a clear lack of knowledge here, but somehow we're going to, we just keep having to do favors and assume that he knows a way to make sense of this extraordinary waste of human life and effort and energy, et cetera. And you have to ask yourself at some point, why, hmm. why do you keep giving? It's like you keep this, this guy, <laughs> he's the guy, he's the homeless man. He's begging you for money. And you know, you see him drunk every time you come there, he's got, he just takes your money and buys alcohol every time. But you're like, all right, I'm going to give him, I'm going to do him one better, give him some more money. We're going to give God more credit <laughs> for making sense. Mm -hmm. Even though we see that it doesn't make sense regularly. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a tangent. <laughs> no, that, 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 that analogy is, is, is really good. Uh, really, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the thing is, I, you know, just to say a quick comment about that, I, I think for me, it was a little bit, because some of this deconstruction happens later, right? So I think that's an important part of what we're trying to 
to dissect here. But, mm. you know, I, I think that, yeah, it's uh, fully engaging our rational minds. I think when we need to is, is not, you know, it, it's not, <laughs> it's not an easy task and it's not, you know, people yeah. are not always in the right place to do that. Yeah. So it's not uh, a comfortable, mm -hmm. it's not a comfortable thing. It's, to not, do. it's not a comfortable thing to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what else you got? Al? All right. So uh, number two, I think is pretty, pretty uh, relevant to right now. Uh, let's talk mm. about the nativity story. Oh, mm. yeah. Mm. So it's, it's not long, but, mm. but let's, uh, let, let, mm. you know, let, let, let's think about this first fact. Okay. So the book of Matthew uh, says that Herod the Great was reigning, right? When he was born. Mm. Uh, when you look at uh, the estimations, uh, I don't know who, who does the estimations, but they'll, they'll put Jesus's birth at around 4 BCE. Mm. Okay. Now here's the problem. If you go to the book of Luke, right, and we're and this is important because it's a synoptic, right? So you would think that they all, were all referencing the same thing here, but as as you know, Luke talks about Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem for the census. Okay, there's one problem with this, and, and all this is not the problem, but the one problem is that actually when you act, do little, uh, if you do a little research, that there was actually no recorded instance of rome like you know let's say when augustus actually ordered this census mm -hmm. back then that people had were forced to go like to move from their home to their ancestral home mm -hmm. to do to do this like there was no there's no evidence that any decree of this required that so but that that's kind of beside the point but let, let's uh here's the important part so we talked about jesus's birth roughly being at 4 bce mm -hmm. now Luke describes that the governor of Syria was Quirinius, right? But the historical records say that he did not start governing there until 6 CE. Mm. So we're, ta we're talking about a good 10 years later, uh, which conflicts with the fact that Herod the Great was reigning at the time, and he actually died. Herod the Great actually died in 4 BCE. Mm. So you have, you know, independent attestations directly contradicting the gospel accounts but then mm. you have the gospel accounts themselves contradicting each other contradicting each other mm. Mm -hmm. now uh that's that, that that's kind of point number one uh mainly uh but point number two uh the massacre of the innocents right in uh in matthew herod orders you know the killing of all boys in bethlehem age mm. two and under once again no corroborating evidence at all so one of the uh, one of the biggest uh, documenters of Herod was Josephus, who actually quite apparently quite well documented a lot of Herod's cruel cruel acts and decrees and things like that. But there was nothing like that at all, mm. um, you know, recorded uh, under under that. So he's got so, no problem laying out Herod's wickedness to his people. Correct. Correct. But there's no mention of that wickedness. There's no there's no mention of the massacre, right? Yeah. At all. Yeah, well, so it doesn't mean it didn't happen, right? It doesn't mean it happened, but <laughs> sure. But you know, you know, you have Moses who who uh you know Pharaoh at the time, right, also ordered uh you know, ostensibly <laughs> wanted to massacre mm -hmm. babies at the time, and then you yeah. have you know, you know, Herod, yeah. right, who has to do the same thing. Is so, isn't it amazing that as a believer, maybe even as a young believer, you look at that and you say, oh, look, Satan did the same thing when Jesus yeah. was born that he did when Moses was born, trying to stop God's plan. Exactly. At some point, maybe if you've had literary training before then, you realize the literary trope. This is this is an, a later author recapitulating an earlier story and trying mm -hmm. to say this person is like this person because this thing mm -hmm. happened like that thing happened. It's a literary device. It's not a historical thing that happened. Right. And if you have a well, and they, they also they also tie it into abortion. <laughs> now yeah. they say, you know, he's trying to kill the baby, he's trying to kill trying the baby so crazy. Baby. Now they, now you're doing abortions. Mm. <laughs> they were out of the womb though. That's kind of weird, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that that's uh that's those are the major points for mm -hmm. the Tudy story. Uh and I think uh the third one, we'll just talk about the Great Flood. Um, and mm. this might go into the next point. I don't know okay. if uh, Jay Wood's going to cover this, but 
Uh, I'm going to stick with the his, the non-historical aspect of the Great Flood. I'm not going to get into the science of it. So uh, we'll see what you do, Jay Witt. But uh, the Great Flood, um, the biggest one that I that I found was that uh, if you, if you're talking about like historical timelines and where where you know uh, biblical scholars have projected the date the Great Flood to happen. Um, Thankfully, uh, if you just look at Egyptian and Sumerian records, they actually go date back way before the the the, the ostensible or, or suggested date for the Great Flood. Mm. And there is no mention at all in the records about any flood of whatsoever, like even a regional or local, you know, anything mm. like that at all. So um, I think that's a pretty, pretty damning one. But uh, the cultural mythical diversity in terms of like, there being lots of different flood accounts. Mm -hmm. One of the things about history that you'll find is that, you know, it's not enough, obviously, to just say like, oh, this event happened and this other culture also talks about another event like that. The It really comes down to the devils and the details. So mm. if you actually analyze each of the cultures and their flood stories and blah, 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 they, the accounts differ widely. Like mm -hmm. there, there's no literally no consistency other than the fact that they claim there was a flood. Hmm. Um, in fact, I think if you do your due diligence, you'd probably be pressed to see that, you know, they're, they're most likely describing more of a local flood than like an entire global catastrophe. So, Except for um, Enuma Elish and Genesis, okay. right? Genesis oh, 6 right. and Enuma Yeah, Elish, Genesis. They've got yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. in common. <laughs> yeah, they got a lot, yeah, right. Yeah. They got a lot in common, right. So... Hmm. that's 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 it for the non-historical for now but obviously the you know we can go on yeah um yeah. i i could see like i said the the believer who's having to wrestle with the things and and i know there's somebody who's going to say ah only the fundamentalist would have a problem with that but i maintain that without fundamentalism you wouldn't have christianity because you need something to hang your god's hat on Fundamentalists say our God literally did these things, whether it be create the earth in six days, whether it be flood, uh, you know, uh, save Noah and his family while he flooded the rest of the earth. Whatever it is, if you don't have a God who's powerful enough to do, do those things and um, involved enough in the affairs of mankind to do those things, it sort of robs Christianity of its sticking power because then what is your God doing then other than just nebulously staying up in heaven and providentially running it all. And so even the claims that only the fundamentalists think that stuff really happened, I think rightly so. The fundamentalists are saying our God acts in history and he's acted in these ways. And when you realize that, wait, I can't hang my hat on it. I can't say definitively that God did this, that he flooded the earth, that he uh, led the children out of you know Egypt in the Exodus. If I can't say that, that was one of my problems, and I think this was part of my deconversion and deconstructing as I deconverted. I did them bo both around the same time, I think. But it, my, my question was, okay, if God didn't do those things, why am I trusting him to have been the one to raise Jesus from the dead? Because for me, the, the reason why I can trust him to raise Jesus from the dead is because he did these other things. If they become non-historical, then I've got no track record to fall back upon to think, oh, the God who did that did this. That's what Paul said, right? The God who did X, Y, and Z is the one who did this. Well, you take X, Y, and Z away. What am I left with? Mm -hmm. so, and, uh, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was, I was, uh, Albert, you were about to say something. Yeah, I was. I, yeah, and I, you know, um, people may say that, you, you know, I, obviously we, we, we got pulled into, you know, this conversation about mytho history and how William Lane Craig talks about that. And, um, which, you know, we're not going to get into, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but the thing is at what point do you, how do you actually devise a criteria that actually makes sense across, you know, all of these accounts and, I, th I think a lot of the problem that we run into with the diversity of 
the accounts like you know we, we we talk about the fact that the bible has multiple voices multiple ways of uh constructing these narratives there's you know the the amount of ways to interpret that is also as diverse as how you might interpret you know ways to somehow you know sneak history into this hmm. and the thing is i you know <laughs> i mean i mean i i don't think anyone can actually do it right i, I just don't like hmm. i don't conceive of how you can try to come up with any kind of framework that you know makes sense of how uh you can somehow extract some some you know validity at all from this historically so that yeah. that's you know that's my problem with it all right yeah and, uh, so the, go ahead. I'm sorry. Were you going to add on? The only thing I was going to say is that it's really important that we don't. A lot of apologists try to, when you corner them on these things, they say, "Look to the elite liberal theologians who are the scholars on it, and don't look at the masses who actually believe that the things took place." And I think that's very dishonest. What do you mean? So, yeah. in other words, well, most people actually do take these stories literally. Like, there, there are a lot of most Christians. Well, I'm sorry. Believe... What, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm lost on is you're saying apologists would point to the liberal theologians. Yes, I, I mean, many. Well, you know, people will say, "Hey, you're not taking into account William Lane Craig, who has a mytho history answer for oh, this." Oh, I'm or, sorry. Or I'm this person calling William Lane Craig liberal is sort of. No, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying William Lane Craig is liberal, but I'm saying, saying that that I'm saying the view that it's mytho history is not the most conservative view. That's a that's okay. a ivory tower view. Yeah, that's a that's not the common Christians understanding of right. the Bible. And so it's dishonest. Well, when I, I, I was would, a Christian, you know, I would have said people like William Lane Craig who would say things like that. They're they're really just snuggling up to the actual liberal atheists not yeah, believing right, yeah. they're right, they're, right, yeah. they're capitulating to them and not being true to what we're supposed to do but we're supposed to fight for I, these things being true absolutely but i just don't want i think one of the chief jobs of the apologist is to make things so muddy you there's lack of clearness perspicuity about what you're actually addressing hmm. i'm just trying to state more emphatically that on the ground hmm. <laughs> The average Christian does believe that the stories are historical. The average Christian believes it was Adam and Eve. In fact, they say it regularly on social media. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Hmm. They 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 don't look at these stories as being non-historical, et cetera. In fact, this is why many of them, when they go to seminary, come out what people bemoan to be unbelievers. Because they go to, <laughs> yes, right, I, I just right. listened to a sermon by a preacher the other day. I'm going to stop it right there. But I listened to a sermon where he was saying a lot of people go to seminary and they come out not believing in X, Y, and Z. And, and, and this Christian who represented basically mainline Christianity was mm -hmm. saying how like that's a basically a travesty that these people go there. But the, the, the thing that happens is they go in maybe a fundamental, I, I hate to say fundamentalist because it almost makes it seem like this is some minority group of of people within right. Christianity. Right. And most Christians, when they look at the Bible's stories about the Exodus, about the flood, mm. there is they have cartoons. Like, I'm not making this up. You can Google, you can search for videos, cartoons to teach little kids mm. about the literal reality of the flood story, et cetera. It's mm. this is part of Christian culture. Okay. They have I movies. get you now. I get you now. Yeah. I yeah. see the deception because the deception yeah. is we want to drill those things in your soul so that you trust God to be powerful enough to do those things. Then we mm -hmm. almost want to pull the rug out from under you and say, oh, but it's not literal, but we still want you to give him credit for, it's like, we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want a God who's powerful enough to do those things, but we don't want the, I've said this before, I think, the embarrassment of believing he literally did them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's and it's like, I'm not going to argue with <laughs> the minority of scholars who believe X, Y, and Z and, and have to try to do back, you know, I'm not here for their jujitsu. Mm -hmm. I'm here to address the masses. 
Like, yeah. we're not, the, the, your, this platform isn't a platform to address people who won't stop believing no matter what you say to them. Mm -hmm. It's to address the masses of people who actually think these things happened. Yeah, And if they find out they didn't happen, they're out the door, like I was. <laughs> you, 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 well, you understand? <laughs> well, let's, let's build on that point. Uh, the, exactly. third, the third dimension is the scientifically impossible passages in the Bible. Yes. And so we can just kind of popcorn these off real quick. It just, this goes right on the hill of what Albert was talking about, about the, the non-historical nature, because some of the non-historical things are things that science has recently helped us realize that can't be historical because that scientifically, it's not just God can't do miracles. It's not that it's, we have evidence that that is not what happened in history. Paul on Mars Hill mm -hmm. tells a story about human history. He's talking to people, talking to Greeks, and he's trying to show how God had a plan for everybody. And how do you do it? Because God made from one man, all men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he spread them out over the face of the earth. Well, mm -hmm. who would you think he's talking about? Who, who well, do you think? Yeah, well, Adam, Adam, the first thing that comes to you mind. You would is think Adam. Adam. You would yeah, think Adam. Right. I would think Adam. I always thought Adam, right. Right? right? For some reason, the Old Testament scholar John Walton comes along and says, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it wasn't Adam. That was Noah. Noah was the one man. Because John Walton had become somewhat convinced by population genetics that show that the amount of genetic diversity in the human population cannot have come from one man or one couple. Mm -hmm. It goes back way further to way many more people. And so Christians in the sciences, Christian geneticists and biologists have been trying to come up with all sort of formulations to show how you could get the diversity we have now from just one couple. And they, I mean, the the imaginative ways that they're coming up with this, they've got to push the date way further back than, than, uh, than when our species was even on the scene. Or they've got to come up with something that merges a a de novo, meaning from from the from scratch. God has to make a man from scratch and merge that man <laughs> with uh one of our pre-human descendant, uh, uh pre-human ancestors. To get the kind of uh, DNA, and he's committing bestiology. Bestiality, he's, he's, almost. He's, well, William Lane Craig tries to make it so that it's not a, it's not something that's so pre-human that it's a beast, but it's far enough back in time to account for however many generations you need to create the diversity. And what they end up doing is, because in our human population we have uh, Neanderthal DNA, we've got d different kinds of DNA, and so you need whatever creation Adam was to have merged with something far enough back to do that. And so anyway, all that to say, John Walton, Old Testament scholar, people read his books, The Lost World of Adam and Eve, The Lost World of Genesis 1 and 2. They read his books. I read his books when I was in seminary. But he says, oh no, that one man that Paul is talking about in Mars Hill, from one man God made all men, we can't say that's Adam anymore. That's got to be Noah. Because we need, we need a creation that's already diverse enough to account for what we see today. And it's got to go back way before. Um, so, Adam. so does Walton go as so far as to say that Noah is, I mean, does it change the federal headship structure at all? Because it's, you no, know, what because I, mean? I think whatever, okay. whatever that first man did still would have impacted Noah okay. because Noah was still a descendant of that first man. Right. Okay. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's unscientific. And once the believer right. learns this, so yes, we are talking about evolution, but deeper than just evolution, evolution just says, oh, well then Genesis two can't be true. Um, there's something else that's got to be happening. You got to, you got to create uh, some yeah. other mass of human beings. And so you split Genesis one and two, you make them two different stories, which they are, but now you make them two different first creations of man. Uh, you do all these different things to try to make what we now know about the world scientifically merge with what you see in the Bible. Uh, and so you can get into that. You can get into, like I said before, the six day creation. Scientifically, we know that that can't be the case. Um, a young earth, that can't be the case. All these things you begin to find out. I can't believe this book the way that I used to. And yes, mm -hmm. like, like Jay Witt said, this does call into 
uh, our, this does call our attention to the fundamentalists, but we don't use the term fundamentalist on this podcast as if those stupid fundamentalists. I think the fundamentalists are right <laughs> to see the Bible as saying these things literally happen because Jesus thought these things literally happen. Right. Paul, Peter seems to think these things literally happen. Mm -hmm. There were angels who left their first estate and came down to get with the daughters of men. Genesis 6, the part of the Bible that William Lane Craig wants to say is mytho history. The New Testament writers treat it as history. Yeah, so, in, in the book of Jude. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I meant Jude, not, not Peter. Well, does, doesn't Peter mention something about this? As Peter well? mentions it too. They, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, all yeah. that to say, uh, this is another dimension of mm -hmm. the Christian is deconstructing and saying, well, man, if I can't believe that, what can I believe? The deconverted person hears these things and says, glad I stopped believing it. The, decon the deconstructing person is, is saying, okay, I I'm taking that apart, but I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to put back together. I've got to have some kind of something to still believe here. Or well, this is another uh, peg, another dimension of your deconstructing mm -hmm. multiverse. Uh, any more comments on that before we move to dimension four? Nope. Jay Witt, take it away. This fourth uh, dimension here is the dimension of uh, the problem of evil. We're going to address it as the problem of evil rather uh, rather upfront, and just uh, even prefacing it with the um, with the the definite article, the problem of evil. You know, okay. some people want to say, you know, it can't be a problem if you don't evil requires hmm. um there not to be a problem for evil <laughs> so so some people turn that sentence on his head and say hey there is no way for you to have a problem of evil if you can't describe evil because you don't have a world view that allows for it but we're gonna we're addressing this again to a, a audience that is sympathetic to evil being a problem in this world and okay. it's it's a it's a problem that finds its source I would say this is going to be interesting to open up to you guys to see what you think. I, I feel like it finds its source in the idea of the omnibenevolence of, of God. Mm -hmm. Because um, hmm, what does omnibenevolence mean when the criterion for goodness is a person? And what I mean by that is, uh, if, in case that sounds like a bit of a puzzle, what I'm saying is, the I, so omnibenevolence sounds like a great attribute. You know, he's the ultimate expression of goodness. But when he can do things <laughs> that are not good or mm. that we recognize, then you end up... It, you, <laughs> Now hold on. Is it's it a, is it him doing things that are not good or him? Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're gonna address. We're gonna address that. We're gonna address okay. that. But no, go ahead. Finish voicing the question. Was it, yeah. Was it him? Is it him doing things that are not good or him allowing things that are not good? That yeah. That well, I mean, there to be a problem of evil. Again, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna try to give voice to the apologists who there. There are plenty of places that the apologist tries to make everything make sense but mm. the bible isn't the bible isn't silent on this matter um um but let's let's start off with uh genesis um 50 20. we'll start off with a typical apologist answer for this right so uh, joseph talking to his brother says as for you you meant it for evil against me but god meant it for good to bring uh it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today so that's that's a typical, I mean, you see it, it recurs in Acts where they're saying, you know, basically that people conspire to put Christ to death and their evil plan, God used it to do is it. But you'll find that that's not always the case. Hmm. Because if you go to Proverbs 16, 4, yeah. you'll see that it says that the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Hmm. So this actually ties back to... Uh, what you were talking about, the non-univocal or univocal uh, nature of the text, where the, you know, you have one book which would readily embrace the concept that God basically <laughs> makes wicked people for for the day of trouble. <laughs> and then another book 
that will and that's not that's not where it ends actually we'll um let me run a little faster here uh oh, we'll go to isaiah 45. i form light and create darkness i make well-being and create calamity and actually uh it, it's, it's interesting again the esv is moving things over <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm going to, because the actual word is evil. I create evil. Well, no, the, the but, term um, evil there actually can and often does simply just mean calamity or destruction. Or, yeah, well, you know, honestly, not, they're kind of evil. like, yeah, but it, it, I, either way, it's not good, right? Mm. You know what? No one's, <laughs> no right. one's here. Do we have anybody <laughs> here that's arguing for calamity being a good thing? <laughs> right. if, if we do, then, then we have a problem on our hands. If we don't, then mm. I can go ahead with the spill. So mm. he's creating calamity. Mm -hmm. And if we have a, I guess there was a, a calamitous situation, I believe that's the, the way you would say it. If we have that kind of thing happening, um, we're, that's generally a bad thing, you know? And he's like, I'm creating this. Well, go, ahead, go ahead. Is it really a bad thing? It's like, let's say, to go back to the univocal voice there, what if mm -hmm. God creating calamity is actually for a good reason? Like, yeah. as, as evangelists, we used to say, somebody says it's not fair that God will send someone to hell, and we would say, don't you want bad people punished? Like, even you think it's a good thing to do bad things to bad people, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, I mean, again, I'm... I'm not I interested the, in putting I stomped a. The, I stopped the atheist. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, yeah, not a, not at all interested in uh, putting a fence around this verse and making it uh, again. I mean, again, we if we say evil there, which mm. is actually somewhat of a synonym for it in light of what calamitous means, right? Mm -hmm. Or calamitous, according to the dictionary, is Oxford Dictionary, is it, it involves calamity. Is catastrophic or disastrous. Mm -hmm. These are horrible events. Um, now, not if they happen to often, the wicked, though, right? Yeah, yeah, but we know that this is. Let's okay. Let's look at the passage in light of its context, mm -hmm. right? I am the Lord. I'm Yahweh, and there is no other uh, besides me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. So the, the concept, he's basically taking credit. He's yeah. like, I'm in charge. Yeah. Like, whatever is happening from the where the sun rises to where it sets, basically, I'm the guy, I'm that dude. Yeah. You know, and it's like, so he's not, at least the writer who's writing this is not yeah. shying away from saying like, he's basically awesome and in charge. He's, he's, and, and the calamity, the calamity there is not specific to the wicked. It's almost no, like, it a, like an ecclesiastical, like any misfortune. It, it basically is giving God credit for, like you said, everything that happens. He's responsible. He runs the show. Yeah. It's yeah. like. The, the point I was making earlier, where I was saying, what does omnibenevolence mean when the criterion for goodness is a person? It's, it comes into sharper relief when you see passages like this, mm -hmm. because then you have a person who's, quote unquote, omnibenevolent doing, creating calamities. <laughs> well, what it does is it relegates and, and relativize, it, it relativizes goodness to that person so that whatever that person does, you end up having to say it's good. Yeah, and this is this is what I was trying to get to. Thank you for that. I was trying to get to this point. When you say you're all good, the general thought is you start ascribing good qualities to a person. But when that person can go ahead and then create calamities or disasters, then it's like the goalpost is moving around. Yeah. Mm. It's like a carrot on a stick. So it's like, oh, I create, I'm omnibenevolent. Wait, wait, wait. But... Uh, there's an allowable, you know, there's, there's, there's this exception here. Before long, your idea of what omnibenevolence, you've abandoned, you've, you've just jettisoned whatever you initially assumed an omnibenevolent being to be. He just carries in a name, but the actual, because it's been relegated to his person, the, so 
it's I'm not even saying this well, but there are so many people who will say, how can you call them evil if you don't have an objective? Well, you don't have an objective standard either. <laughs> right. Because because you've tied goodness to this being that can act in this capricious way and do all of these horrible things. And what it leads the, you to that, realize is you 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 haven't tied it to a being who's omni anything. You've tied it to capricious men. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. where the deconstruction comes in as you realize, wait, sort of like you said about the hymen or, you know, people who have issues with slavery in the Bible or people who uh, see the genocide, you, you go into Jericho to take the land and kill all the men, the women, the children. People mm -hmm. read this and they say, let's go back to another point we made in, in an episode recently. It's because you have the blame, blame Christianity, really. You have such a high view of God that you can't see your God commissioning genocide or commissioning murder, or, you know, capital punishment for the things he issues capital punishment for or whatever it is. And because that high view of God is there, you end up saying, well, then, then the one that I'm worshiping in the Bible can't be who I thought. It's almost like you're, you're trying to, um, who was it? Emmanuel Kant, right? trying to protect God from the liberal theologians, put God in this noumenal category. Mm -hmm. The Bible is phenomenal. The Bible is something that man made, and we can dissect that, and we can deconstruct that. That's perfect. We're talking about deconversion, de deconstruction, rather. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about I, deconstruction. I, Go ahead. I, I almost kind of see the relationship to, you know, how certain people, certain well-meaning people, uh, agreeable people, people that you might, People you might like, you know, at work or your friends and and then, you know, you just get this like weird, like, like, why do they like this other guy who is a total narcissist, <laughs> who's a total like, that's you know, good, yeah, just that's a good one. selfish, just like you don't like, like, you just yeah. don't get it. And, you know, yeah, they may have be very charismatic and, mm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And and then you just kind of like, why? You know mm. why, and and you and you you might ask them why, and they might say like, well, you know, I I don't know, you know, mm. it's like they they may not may, they may not even articulate it. So it's it's yeah. one of those things where it's like it, it be if you can't articulate it, mm. you know, if we're gonna talk about the omni characteristics of God, and and you can't even have a conversation around that, and I think we that becomes like a very pro that's a big problem, really. You know, I, I remember as a Christian. You know, I just say this one last point, yeah, but I remember yeah. as a Christian, when 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 certain atheists would point out how these omni characteristics cannot coexist together at all, it didn't do anything for me, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. like it's like it mm -hmm. was just like it was like bullet that just bounced off. But mm -hmm. it's like now that you really <laughs> think about yeah. it, then it's like okay, well, yeah, we have to take it seriously, right? Yeah. It's like this is yeah. something, you know. So yeah, you know, know, I was going to add to your analogy about the coworker. Yeah. You have these experiences where in order to protect your respect for a person, you end up having to sort of just limit your exposure to them because you feel like if I get to know you anymore, I might lose the respect I do have for you. Right. You're spending so much time with this person that I really can't respect. Right. Mm -hmm. That to, to, to save whatever I have, to salvage whatever I respect I have for you, let's just keep our relationship right where it is. I don't need to learn any more about you. That way I won't lose any more respect. Right, right, that right. sort of is what the, that's what the deconstructing person ends up doing with their concept of God. It's like, wait, if I keep learning more about you, that you're ordering genocides and you're okay with slavery and you're, you're lying about how you created the heavens and the earth. And you, if I keep learning, I'm not going to be able to respect you anymore. Let me just, let me just stop it right where it is. And I do one of two things. Either I say, I can't, worship the God of the Bible, or I just worship him from a distance. That's, that's where the person who doesn't deconvert, that's what they do. They deconstruct and they worship from a distance, lest they learn anything else about God that makes them, that was me when I when I left seminary. Yeah. When I said to God, I can't see you in the Bible anymore. I need to see you in your world. That yeah. was me trying to lessen my... <laughs> the the decreasing respect that I had for God. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the person... Is the person choosing rather than going on Jerry Springer and seeing the mounds of makeup he was wearing on the show, deciding, "Hey, I'll just watch him on TV, so I don't have to get the up close <laughs> view, <laughs> so I don't have to see it," you know? But but you know you know is, what is the opposite of benevolence? 
it's malevolence. Mm -hmm. Malevolence, right. What happens basically is you start seeing this omni benevolent God as this omni malevolent God. That's mm. that is to say a God that is um I don't even want to say omni malevolent. I want to say he's He's some sort of weird mixture, if anything. We can't say he's all. Yeah. Oh gosh. Rather than having this this sort of definitive omni benevolent God, you have some sort of mixture of benevolence and malevolence. Because the text itself says, you know, he's he's up to no good sometimes too. You know. Well, um, we got these weird um, analogies going on tonight, but it makes me think about one of my favorite characters from um, one of my favorite shows, Arrested Development. There's a character um, who just is, you know, he's he's just a, he's a very unprofessional man, Wait, Which one? Tobias? Joe. Tobias or Job? Job. Yeah, Job, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he basically is, you know, he's just unprofessional, good for nothing, you know, son of a rich, uh, rich father. Yeah. But there's this one episode where he's trying to coach his younger brother into how to meet a woman, or how to, how to get a woman. Basically, he has to. He tells her, "You have to save her." And he says, "Save her from what?" He says, "Well, you, you've got to create a dilemma to save her from." So what you do is you, you go and you siphon all the gas out of her car. Oh so my that, gosh! So yeah. that when she comes out to start a car, it's out of gas, and then you come along and you save her from that predicament. So like you're you're you're, you're malevolent and you're benevolent. You you cause the chaos. Then you come oh, along that's with a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, we could deep dive into this <laughs> this characteristic. So yeah, that's great. That's what does the Bible say? Yeah, Before the foundation of the world, world he chose right. us in Him to be, yeah. you know, to exactly. be in Christ. And all. He, yeah. he, he, he <laughs> created <laughs> us. Yeah. Um, but but in setting up this problem to save us, he's got to yeah. he's got to create other people that he's not going to save, that they're going to be in hell so that the vessels of honor can look at the vessels of dishonor and say, man, I'm glad I'm not like it's them. Just a, it's an awful scheme. It's like the scheme of a psychopath. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's it like psychopathic, it really, man. It's it crazy. really is. It really it's, is. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's what, that's my contribution for the, the I, I, you know, it's a, a big a, a overview. And I, like I say, they all relate to each other. Mm. So it's an overview of, because you, once you realize that it isn't a univocal voice in scripture, then you see, okay, the scripture, the scriptures do present both. There is a passage where, um, you know, the self same act first, the, the angel of the Lord incites them, the, you know, David to, to number Israel, then, then the, you know, a, a Satan, mm -hmm. you know, uh, incites them to, to number Israel. So, you know, who knows? You know, it, yeah. could, it could be both. You know, and, and there are people who look at this problem and they they zoom the camera lens back. Uh, one of our uh, most frequent commenters have even has even said, and this is guy, he's still a believer. Uh, yeah, I might as well just shout him out, David seven seven seven. You can see his comments on our thread all the time. But David said, man, the problem of animal suffering, even before you know humans are on the scene, you have animals, you know, suffering mm -hmm. greatly mm -hmm. for eons. Um, mm -hmm. how do you call God? How do you reconcile God's goodness with a planet that just seems to survive via suffering? Um, mm -hmm. how do you call that all good? You know, Genesis one is God made this and it was good. God made this and it was good. God made this and it was good. You look at the scientific record and you see that wasn't good or that wasn't good. These animals right. suffered. These animals died. They, like 99% of the species on this planet have gone extinct. It's like what I, I think I said this. Yeah, I said this to you uh, on the phone at one point that, you know, in a context where God presents Adam and Eve with this, the skins of animals to cover their nakedness, mm -hmm. you can see just how much disregard for animal life there was right. because I mean, just all you have to do is just imagine him presenting them with human skins for right. covering. <laughs> like, like, you would be, you would be, be Animal lector. Right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We're all animal lectors. Right. But I mean, I, that just shows you that there was a certain amount of disregard for the life of animals and, right. and the suffering of, the, of, right. of animals. And you can see it today. We had a little discussion about the idea that, uh, there, I, you know, I was listening to some true crime um, story about uh, some brothers who, uh, or relatives, I can't remember who they were brothers, but they had killed some people and they also killed their dog. And 
they killed the dog by beating the dog to death with a with a golf club, mm-hmm. and they got Horrible. time for for beating the dog with the with the golf because we have evolved in our morality at this point where we actually see, you know, the mistreatment of a dog as something that they probably wouldn't have even recognized. Hold on, you're not saying but they got time for the dog and not for the humans that they harmed. You know no, saying? no, I'm saying that I'm saying that in their sentencing, they, they acknowledged the time. crime. Yeah. yeah, they 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 acknowledged the crime that they committed against the dog. And what I'm what I'm contrasting that with is an earlier time in human history when mm. they would have probably been put to death for sure, but there wouldn't have been any acknowledgement of the crime they committed against the dog. Right. And yeah. it's similar to God just you know presenting them not for he, the animals weren't even killed for food they they were just to, to make clothing out of them yeah. for adam and eve you see what i'm saying right, right. so there's i mean we you eat, got an we old have restaurants you got an old testament full of animal yeah. sacrifices yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. you've yeah. even got yeah. places where god seems to accept human sacrifices right so it's mm-hmm. like yeah the the problem of evil is just compounded when you look at what the god of the bible seems okay with even if it's I'm just setting up a win in the end. The amount of evil mm-hmm. that you're that you're allowing just to get to this win, like the win's got to be astronomical for all the losses and suffering that you're allowing just to get there. Yeah. And yeah, even I as mean, I'm it saying a... this, I was gonna say, even as I'm saying this, you guys have heard me say this over and over again, like little by little, I'm coming to grips with why the problem of evil is a problem for some people because for me. I used to just chuck it up to, oh, well, sin entered the world and therefore suffering. But mm-hmm. even in this conversation, I'm realizing like, man, the God who saw all this suffering, since he knows the end from the beginning, you saw all this suffering and still decided to press the go button on this existence. That is a mm-hmm. huge problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's like, John Piper himself even said, I remember the quote exactly. He said, where does an evil impulse arise in creatures who are created good? Hmm. I mean, well, he can ask the question. I'll answer it. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that, John Piper. <laughs> it, it arose from God's creation, right? Mm-hmm. Because God himself had already set the whole plan into action. And so that you can attribute the creation of that evil impulse and it, if he's the creator and nobody else created anything and he creates these creatures and they have an impulse, well, there's, <laughs> this is not a difficult math to do. It comes from him. But the reason why it's a problem for John Piper is because he believes in this, this idea of omnibenevolence. Mm-hmm. And, and in his mind, he can't, re- he, and in his mind, he can't reconcile uh, this evil impulse that Adam and Eve had to break God's law with God creating them good, but that's not necessarily the text that's yeah. doing. That's his abstraction of some sort of uh, doctrine of omnibenevolence that has nothing to do with uh, a univocal voice in a text, yeah. for sure. And it yeah. creates a problem for him. Well, this problem of evil actually leads to the fifth dimension of the deconstruction multiverse. And that is not so much the problem of evil, but the problem of divine hiddenness. Very many people come to a point where they begin to say, where is God? We can't see him. We can't hear him objectively. So you sort of just have this sense in which, okay, we're told he's omnipresent. Where is he? Well, he's just all around and we're in him somewhere, but he never makes himself visible. He never makes himself audible, not in an objective way. Then you go to the psalm and you, you know, have the psalmist saying, where, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the deep, and make my bed in Sheol, you're there. And you find yourself saying, well, prove it. Like, where are you? Where is God? Well, that question really becomes a problem to the person who looks at the problem of evil and says, man, where is God? And why is it that you have a, a God who seems to, in the in the Bible at least, he does a lot of revealing himself. But then in the world today, there's this absence, there's this, this hiddenness, this to the point where you have a world full of religions 
You would think a God who wanted to reveal himself would at least give everyone the same truth, the same Bible, the same beliefs, and then let them reject them if they want. But at least you're all rejecting the same. But no, you haven't even revealed yourself to all peoples. Now, of course, mm. Romans 1 would say he has revealed himself. Psalm 19 right. would say, you know, every time the sun rises and you know, every time every, God, the creation speaks of him. But that's not the same thing as what does he say? I revealed myself by my name. Like, who are you and what are you up to? God seems to be very absent. The omnipresence seems to be an omni absence. And at some point you end up saying that that could be an indication that what I always thought was the case is not the case. The, the times I thought I felt God's presence is a song we used to sing when I was a Christian growing up in church. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the presence of the Lord. You start wondering like, man, that time I thought I felt the presence of the Lord. Was I just hyping myself up? Was it just the music? Was it, were the chills really just a physiological psychosomatic? You start getting skeptical to these ideas about the time I thought I heard God speak to me. Could that have just been my inner voice? Could that have, where is he? Does he ever, does he ever show up? Is there something in God's program that necessitates that he be absent? Is it because, like I used to think when I started reading the Bible, oh, that's why God's not visible. We sinned. He sent us away from his presence. And therefore, but at some point you begin to say, well, man, that doesn't make sense because he showed up again to Moses and he showed up in this passage and this, what prevents God from showing up? He showed up for David. Like this guy, this guy had somebody killed and took his wife. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like you, 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 but you, well, even with that, I guess he showed up to a prophet. You know, he didn't really show up mm -hmm. in the flesh, in the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you you gave him out of transfiguration appearance. And oh, you. So you're saying? I mean, okay, because you know, David was supposed to be also a prophet who experienced the spirit coming upon him and him making these prophecies that are in, in the Psalms. At least he had some sort of... Right. But but I mean, uh, even you know. we still today think the spirit falls upon us and we do things so we could just, you know... So you're, you're talking about an external kind of... External kind of... Like like somebody could even say... Um, <laughs> we talked about this in that, one of our earlier pods. He showed up to the children of Israel, but it was so scary that they asked God not to do it again. They told Moses, right. hey, you speak to us from now on. So you have these ideologies for, for why God doesn't show up, show up anymore because right. it's so scary when he does. But like we said, well, he showed up to Adam and Eve. You know what? I just had a thought. I just had a thought. What? That's probably why they did the whole no one can see God and live. Oh, of course. That's it. Yes. That's it. I mean, you know, that whole story is based on it, but I mean, the general fear or not when, you know, the angel of the Lord appears and it's like, oh, they were very, they were sore afraid. And then the angel says, fear not. So don't expect an angel to appear to you. It's you right. better not. It, it's written to you make know? you, to make you thankful that he doesn't appear because if he that didn't it, appear, Exactly. He thankful for attack. the fact. <laughs> exactly. It makes you, it's, it's made, written to make you thankful for divine hiddenness. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, yeah, yeah exactly. To, to thank you, to be thankful for the status quo being a world that is just, <laughs> just full of, of naturalism and banality. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A, a but, God but, world. but now you got a bunch of Christians uh, dealing with abandonment issues now mm. <laughs> as a result yeah. of uh, yeah. you know, that yeah. kind of policy. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's um, so crazy. I mean, you know, it's it's wild because it <laughs> even the text telling us fear not and all of that and all of the oh, you know, he came and he scared the shit out of them and whatever. Mm. That still hasn't stopped the impulse of people wanting God to show up. Like you have the whole mm. Pentecostal movement, you know, right. like people creating right. fabricating miracles. You well, know, some people say the reason why God doesn't show up is because if he did show up, it would rob us of the free will. Because now we would know he was real. It wouldn't be faith anymore. Rob me. Rob me. <laughs> <laughs> rob me. You know, yeah. if that's what. Like... <laughs> well, another reason why that doesn't make any sense is because that apparently didn't stop Adam and Eve from having free will enough to sin. Yeah, exactly. So there's, exactly. Nothing, right. there's nothing that necessitates that God remains hidden. It wouldn't stop us from being able to. Except for the fact that he can't show up. 
Well, that's the only thing. That's a, and that's what the problem in this dimension of deconstruction is. You end up saying the only thing that seems to be preventing God from showing up is his inability to do so. It's not a matter of will or it would throw off his plan or anything. It's apparently he can't. Otherwise, yeah. he would. Um, J.L. Schellenberg is the guy who came up with the uh, this formal argument for, for the problem of divine hiddenness. Um, he says a, a ultimately good God, omnibenevolent God, who's perfect, who intends to reveal himself to people. If that were the case, if such a thing existed, there would be no such thing as non-resistant non-belief. Resistant non-belief, sure, people who just don't want to believe. But the non-resistant non-believers would not exist because God would... God would have made himself available to the non-resistant non-believers mm -hmm. who want to believe, but they just don't have enough evidence. And because God hasn't done that, that's proof that he doesn't exist. When people who were Christians deconvert, mm -hmm. a lot of them don't go into spiritualism. Once you fully deconstruct and deconvert, a lot of people go right from Christianity to atheism and the question always is why why not some other god why not some other and i realized something christianity has basically made me an atheist because it got me so used to the idea of if there is a god this god is going to reach out to you this god is going to communicate with you this god is going to seek you out find you reveal himself to you but when you come to the point where you realize, oh, okay, so the Bible is not that. The Bible is not the revelation of a God, but a God reveals himself. So if, if no God revealed himself to me in the Bible, then the category in my mind that I have of God is one who reveals himself. I don't have any revelation. And then you say, well, what about the other religions? None of the other gods have been proactive in reaching out to me in the way that I thought the God of the Bible has. So if that's the case, what you end up doing is you end up using a hiddenness of God argument against these other gods who were silent to you, who were silent with you the whole time that you were believing in this one particular God. Now that you realize that this one particular God has been silent too, you end up putting the God that you were worshiping in the same category with all the other gods who have been silent this entire time. And so the Christian who tries to say the hiddenness of God is not a real argument, I think they fail to realize that they're using they're using a hiddenness of God argument against all the other gods that they don't believe in because they don't believe that Vishnu has reached out to them. They don't believe Allah has reached out to them. They don't believe had Allah reached out to them, they might have believed, but Allah hasn't. And so it's all it's weird because it's almost like you have to deconvert to, to understand this logic. But upon deconverting, you, I think you will realize it's the hiddenness of God against all the gods, including the one that you're letting go of now that makes you say, oh, okay, so then atheism does make sense because if there was a God, then this other God would have done what I thought the Christian God did this entire time. Does that make sense? Yes, it absolutely does. Um, yeah. So I would say that's more or less correct. That's granted the person who's deconverting is deconverting for what I would consider to be valid reasons. Right. Because I have seen Christians leave the faith or people leave Christianity and only to pick up some other yeah. ridiculous kind of worldview. Right. Yeah, that's uh, or convert to like, another religion. Yeah, that's why I said at the beginning. There's some people who, who deconvert, then they go to something else. But like we said a, a while ago, if you don't fully deconstruct, are you really fully deconverted because you're kind of still in that space where you could mm -hmm. pick up something else? Yeah, I'm just very, very, very sensitive to uh, the no true, uh, no true Scotsman fallacy that mm -hmm. we've we've actually done a deep dive into because people say to us, uh, you know, many Christians say if you leave that you just show yourself to have never been. Yeah, and then we say, well, that's that's a convenient position to take for you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a special pleading mm -hmm. so that any individual who ends up leaving, 
reveals themselves to not have been authentic. Okay, well, I mean, you will never, you'll never get a good challenger to your faith with that. So I'm right. hesitant to do that to others, even yeah. be converts. Right. I, that's why I, instead of saying making my position a true position, I, hmm, I, I'm more interested in articulating more clearly what my position is than yeah. trying to state that, that it's it's a more true version. I mean, who yeah. knows? For them, well, maybe that seems like a solution. Well, like I said, well, this is back, goes back to our conversation about No True Scotsman early on in our, our podcast. I do think that there are biblically some litmus tests for what does it mean to actually be in the faith? So the person, like when I, I recently interviewed my sister, and even as she was telling me her deconversion story, I was like, ooh, sounds like you hadn't even really heard the Pauline justification by faith gospel. So I think yeah. there's room to challenge somebody and say, ah, you weren't a true Christian. You weren't a true if they hadn't embraced certain things. And in the same way, I think it's if there's room to say to the, the, the deconvert, are you really a true deconvert if all you've done is left this particular branch of belief, but you're still open to some other metaphysical idea. Yeah, maybe you did deconvert from this religion, but what we're talking about in, in terms of deconversion, I think, well, I guess maybe maybe that's the question. When we use the term deconversion, are we talking about just deconverting from a specific faith, or are we talking about fully embracing the skeptical mind that looks at all religions and says it's all it's all part of the same superstitious ball of wax? No, good stuff. Good stuff. I, I'm. I'm also just to put my just you know full just to be transparent here. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure. I'm becoming more. Even the idea that there's a way to authenticate a person's Christianity is becoming mm -hmm. more of an elusive thing. Oh yeah. As I, I am becoming more immersed into via this podcast, actually into regurgit um rehashing is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. rehashing many of the things and, and, and really seeing the problems with the whole, if I can speak of the whole edifice of, of Christianity, this whole, whatever we consider this apparatus to be, I, this idea that you have an orthodoxy and that, okay, first I have to know you were this before you deconvert. It's like, I'm starting to become less, as <laughs> yeah. I know, as yeah. I'm becoming more aware of what Christian history is, yeah. I'm less, I'm, I'm less concerned with that, if that yeah. makes any sense. No, but I yeah, I don't for want sure, to be long sure. with it. And let's not go too much further before we get Al rope back into this discussion. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Well, let's end on this note, unless anybody has any other thoughts on that. Let's do this. Let's just for, for shits and giggles here. Let's throw up the six stages of deconversion. And try to just imagine ways or just tie in um, how these different uh, how these different dimensions of deconstruction might pair with or send somebody down the road of this stage of deconversion. So going from fundamentalist to starting to question inerrancy and infallibility which of these five dimensions could send somebody down that path? Mm. Yes, yeah, definitely number one, I imagine. Oh, for uh, sure. Recognizing that the, the scripture doesn't speak with one voice. Mm -hmm. The contradictions what, what in the you... text making somebody say, yeah, what, okay, what, maybe what, it's not what, inerrant. What, what, one through three, yeah. One, one through, through three. three. Yeah. The non-historicity. Yeah, 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 he's right. Yeah, yeah, non-historicity and the non-scientific. Oh. It's okay. going to make somebody so, say, I've got to get up on, on an embassy yeah. in the foundation. So I'm going to say one through three. If if, Al, if we're going with Al's one through three, we've got to go from one through three on that chart, too, because fundamentalist to inerrancy, infallibility to socially liberal, I think they are all connected, too. How how does how does seeing the non-historical... I could see how it could turn somebody theologically liberal, but how could it turn somebody socially liberal? Yeah, I just feel like that's like once you start recognizing that it's pretty much scientifically impossible and that the history is kind of shoddy, mm -hmm. I think that you just become more liberal in general. Uh, I get it. I, that's yeah. my guess. I get it. Yeah. So sort of like if I can't take this text to the bank on these issues, 
why am I going to take it to the bank on gay marriage or yeah, you know, that's euthanasia what I'm thinking. or something like that? I get it. Yeah, yeah, but because I it mean, happened to me. I'm It ready happened for, to me. I'm ready for some pushback, but I think yeah, No, no, no. you're going to become yeah. That happened to me. I, I didn't realize it, but no, you're right. That happened to me. It was my inability to take the text to the bank on certain claims, history-wise and scientific-wise, that made me take my foot off the gas on social issues. So you're you're 100 right on that. You know, it's odd because I stopped it at probably just for it being neat. Uh, because I stopped it there at three, you probably could go from one to four. Yeah, that's why I said I could see. I could see how <laughs> you it go made like me, yeah, theologically liberal. Yeah. One, one, two, three on the on the the five dimensions corresponds to like one to four on the on this this chart here. Yeah. Okay. Now I think the prayerlessness, Bibleistness. And uh, churchlessness corresponds to probably the problem of evil and the hidden of God. Hid hidden of God. God. I, I, I yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. For sure. Um, well, and that's actually, the whole chart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I was going to say the, the first three dimensions could also produce a skeptic as well. So I could say, I could. I can go one to four on the deconversion chart and five. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. you do become more skeptical, more okay with gray area -ness. Um, Yeah. And then, like you said, the problem of evil and the divine hiddenness leading to prayerlessness, Bibleistness, and churchlessness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> by the time you've gotten to prayerlessness, Bibleistness, or churchlessness, you probably... Like if you were me, you were you probably already a skeptic. And you just, I mean, some, somebody might argue that the skeptic is in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe the skepticism be before the, the prayerlessness, <laughs> Biblelessness, and churchlessness. We might have to yeah, do that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Because you're you're definitely a cynic. <laughs> you might yeah. you you might not be a skeptic, but you're quite cynical by that point. Yeah. If, you, right. if you're prayerless, Bibleless. And churchless, you're mm. definitely a cynic. If if I mean, <laughs> mm. you're definitely a cynic by that point. Yeah. But yeah, I think we just that that was a that was a pretty swift uh connecting the dots there. I think that, that pretty much says it all. Um so in the chat, you guys can talk to us about which of the uh five dimensions of the deconstruction multiverse uh pushed you to which stages of deconversion. Yeah, be curious about that. Yeah. <laughs> And if you haven't yeah, deconverted that's... yet, maybe you can just talk about where you are in your deconstruction. Yeah. Sounds good, man. I really do hope this is helpful for people. I really do hope that this uh, encourages people to know you're not crazy. The reason why we can sit around and talk about this is because we went through all these things at different, different stages and over many years. Um, and so, yeah, you're not crazy. You're not alone. Um, and you have the freedom to think these thoughts and the ground's not going to open up and swallow you up unless you live on a sinkhole. And by some coincidence, you just happen to, I mean, coincidences do happen. Like I, I, uh, mm -hmm. I'll be talking about this on Facebook at some point. I just say that to say, uh, you're, you're in, you're in good company. Uh, if you're yeah. deconstructing and you're deconverting, that is the human. It is, it is, it, it is interesting to see how many yeah. Christians look at you when you are vocal Mm. about your deconversion like if you're public facing with your deconversion how they, they seem to just want you to you will see occasional comments like you know you're going to see god and it's they're mm. basically saying i want you to 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 be judged for what you know and it's like it's just it's just an interesting take from mm. people who are readily trying to win people over to to heaven you know well uh, I, what i get is people who People who want me to be saved, they want God to re reveal himself to me and show me whatever I need to believe again. They want that. It's only when I start becoming vocal with my unbelief that they begin to either warn or want my judgment. Yeah. yeah. You think you think imprecatory psalms have been uh, placed on you, Brady? Oh, I'm sure there's, yeah, there's, there's very sure many has. people yeah. who want me to get my <laughs> you know, divine it, comeuppance. Yeah. The, the crazy thing is, because of the way life is, 
if you wait around long enough, you're going to feel like you've been vindicated in that regard, right? Right. right. Like, I'm if, going to die. Believer, something's going to happen, and they can always pin that on. See, God finally got them. Yeah, it, but it's just like you know, it's going to also happen to them too. That's right. The, exactly. Like, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, that was that was actually comforting to me. I said, you know, none of us are going to know until we die, and when we die there will likely be no knowing to know at that point. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the last thing that I can say about deconstruction is, you know, it's okay to allow time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think it was a, it was a close friend of mine who told me that uh, his father told him that time heals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think this is all part of that process too. So, you know, you don't have yeah. to, you know, we, we did cover a lot of ground, but you could kind of nibble at it, you know, yeah. you don't have to, you know, take it all at once, you know, so yeah. just take whatever you can get. You know? Good stuff. Yeah. It's wild that you have to do this much work to disprove an obvious man-made, an obviously man-made fabrication, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, that's very, it shows you just how much, I guess it shows you how valuable the questions the Bible answers mm. are to people in general. Yeah. Yeah. That's not to say that the Bible is valuable. I'm just saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The things, it, it, so it, it it does speak to your idea of the the, I guess the ultimate question kind of thing that you said, where I kind of dismissed it, and I still mm -hmm. do. But it, I, it shows you that on in in mass, humans tend to have we share a desire to have certain huge, unanswerable, largely questions answered. Yeah. Um, and if you can present people with the system, even if it's very, very obviously human made, human, you know, and flawed, people will embrace it and defend it. Like, well, you that's know. because of what it's tied into the verse that you read, right? I create well being and calamity. Mm -hmm. If I can tell you that your well being is tied to this, to worshiping this, you know, this deity, I, and I'm so convinced, you know, we just talked about coincidence. I'm so convinced of this, that God is simply the nickname or the pet name that we've given to coincidence to convince ourselves that we have some control over it, that we have more mm -hmm. control over our destiny than we typically would if we didn't pet name coincidence and, and spark up a relationship with it to convince ourselves that we can get it to work for us. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, Every, everybody who's ever been late to the airport and <laughs> try as uh, as wish that they have somebody who could move things around for them. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody who's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's the the thing I feed myself with when I find myself because even now, believe it or not, sometimes you find yourself wishing you had somebody to like. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that I have to consistently tell myself is just there's no reason for me to be that narcissistic. Mm. It's basically that's what it comes down to, to yeah. for me. So and it's like I use that to combat the impulse to wish that some, you know, like traffic gets moved to the side for me, et cetera. You know, mm. there's wow. no reason to live in a world that self focused in myopic. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. All right, fellas. Thank you guys for your time and for your, uh, energy and and your minds pouring into this kind of content and uh, we'll catch you guys who are watching in the chat till next time peace all right peace